Hello everyone, welcome again to Modeling Methods in Mechanical Engineering and today we are going to continue our discussion on differential equations and more importantly we're going to shift gears now to uh, partial differential equations which is the reason why we introduced uh, eigenvalue problems as a, as a special kind of ordinary differential equation last time and this one class of differential equations that is going to help us with the solution of partial differential equations. So let's get to it and uh, Modeling methods in EMI. So <clears throat> we are going to talk about partial differential equations or PDE and These are differential equations whose solution depend, depends on at least two dimensions or at least or at least one dimension and time. So we could be talking about boundary value problems, we could be talking about initial value problem in combination with the boundary value problem. So depending on what dimensions the solution is a function of, then uh, we would need a set of boundary conditions, initial conditions, and so on. So we're basically talking, the reason they're called partial differential equation is because the solution itself or the field function is a, is a function of multiple independent variables. So it can be space and time or space and space, or it can be other kind of things. If, if the function itself or the field variable itself is, is a function of other quantities, but it's at least two of them. And therefore you'll see partial derivatives in the equation. Now, depending on the problem, boundary conditions, initial conditions, etc. Different techniques may be used to solve PDEs. Okay. So there is another a number of analytical techniques we start with that, we start with analytical methods, exact solutions. The most common one is called separation of variables, SOV. Superposition and separation of variables, it's just this, a modification that allows us to cover a wider range of problems. Variation of parameters, VOP. Four, we can use Laplace transforms to solve partial differential equations. We can also use Fourier transforms. We can use complex solutions or sustained periodic problems. We can use uh, Duhamel's theorem. For time dependent boundary conditions, we can use Green's functions method. Green's function. method, the green functions method. And there's a few more that will help us get to that point. But uh, the idea is that for all these cases, uh, there would have to be the requirement is that the problem would need to be linear. And all these solution techniques, the common requirement
is that the PDE, which is also the governing equation, and boundary conditions slash initial conditions are linear. And it's a common requirement. Then each one of them would actually be applicable for different instances of the problem, or different configurations of the problem with more or less restrictions. So <clears throat> let's start with the first one. And obviously we're not going to go over all these techniques. You'll have, you need an entire semester just to go over a couple of them. Uh, we're going to try to go over separation of variables and superposition and then try to expand that to um, situations in which you have uh, uh, curvilinear coordinates or different combinations of boundary conditions and so on. All right. So let's look at separation of variables. SOV, and as the name implies, we are going to separate the variables. We're going to take a problem that it might be a function of space x and y and we try to we're going to try to find a solution in x and a solution in y and see how that works this is due to d'alembert also credited to bernoulli and also credited to euler so they all sort of work on versions of these techniques separately main requirements is that the problem is linear. Governing equation, boundary conditions, initial conditions. Everything has to be linear. Initial conditions if the problem is a function of time. Also geometry must be framed in an orthogonal slash separable coordinate system and lastly I'm going to put a star on this one because it is a very limiting restriction okay we know that for all solution processes or solution methods the problem needs to be linear Geometry must be framed in an orthogonal separable coordinate system. That means it has to be a rectangle. If we're talking about partition coordinates, then it would have to be a rectangle. Uh, but there are some analytical techniques, like, for example, Green's function method, where you can get away with non-regular geometries, like triangles and things like that, but nothing further, further than that. You cannot do an airfoil, for example. It has to be something square or nicely shaped frame perfectly into a separable orthogonal coordinate system. If you're, if you're trying to solve the problem in cylindrical coordinates, it would have to be a cylinder or a hollow cylinder. That's pretty much it, or a section of a cylinder also. But the most limiting restriction of the separation of variables technique is that no more than one non-homogeneity in BC I C and governing equation. All right, so you're only allowed to have one non-homogeneous condition, and uh, and that's it. Whether it's in the initial condition, the boundary condition, or in the equation itself, there can only be one. It's very restricting. Yes. So in solving, we first of all form eigenvalue problem in the homogeneous direction or directions I'm going to put an S here in parentheses because there could be more than one homogeneous direction and since we have none we have one non-homogeneity we have to have at least one right well we can only afford to have one but that one needs to exist because if you don't have any non-homogeneities if everything is homogeneous governing equation boundary conditions and initial condition then the solution is zero it's a trivial solution so you have to have at least one non-homogeneous condition and at most one non-homogeneous condition so use orthogonality of the resulting eigenfunction 
to find the constant or the constants of integration. So there you go. So that's why the property of orthogonality is so important. The property that we learned that all eigenfunctions have uh, orthogonality properties um, with respect to different weight functions, depending on what the eigenfunction is. But that is going to be key in determining the constants of integration that result out of the solution process. And you'll see that briefly. So we're going to go straight to an example and see how that works. All right. All right. So let's go straight to an example. And we're going to look at solving the steady heat conduction in constant in a constant conductivity medium without heat generation okay so if we look at uh, the heat equation, Fourier heat equation, remember we have a balance between energy that goes in and out of the domain, and that balance can be changed by generation of energy and is accumulation of energy through the specific heat of the domain. So basically the conductivity of the domain times the gradient of the temperature is the heat flux or negative of the conductivity times the gradient of the temperature is the heat flux. So the divergence of the heat flux essentially mean the counting of or, or the balance of the energy due to heat in and out of the domain, which added to the energy generation is equal to the amount of storage of energy within the domain. Now we said that we're going to assume that the uh, that the domain or the medium has constant conductivity, so we can take that K out of here, so constant K. We also were told that there's no generation, so no generation will make this one zero. And we're also told that the problem is steady. It means that it has reached the point where there's no more accumulation of energy. And therefore, the temperature field doesn't change in time. So when we are told that a problem is steady state, basically means that all partial derivatives with respect to time are equal to zero. So basically, everything's zero. We take the k out of, out of here. We'll end up with a governing equation that simply uh, looks like this. The Laplace of t is equal to zero. Okay, so that's the governing equation. That's the partial differential equation that governs this problem. And we are going to assume, let's actually do this like this, that the domain in the x and y direction, now we have a two-dimensional domain, goes from 0 to L in the x direction and from 0 to L in the y direction. So we basically have a rectangle. like this and uh, we have some conditions on the bottom we have temperature equals zero so first kind there is like condition force temperature t e is equal to zero here let's say that t is equal to zero here and let's say that on this wall right here at x equal l or big l t is equal to some function of y so we have a variation of the temperature different than zero at that point. So as you can see, the governing equation is homogeneous. All initial, all boundary conditions are homogeneous except one. If everything was were unhomogeneous, then the solution is zero. There's no non-trivial solution to this problem. So the boundary conditions can be listed as temperature at x equals zero comma y. So, and by the way, the temperature is a function of x and y. Okay. There's no T because the problem is steady, and we're assuming that the Z direction, nothing changes in the Z direction. This is either infinitely 
infinitely uh, long in the direction into and out of the paper in the z direction, or is uh, insulated on the top and the bottom on the in the direction of the paper. Okay. So we know that the temperature at x equals zero comma y, which is this wall here, is equal to zero. We are told that the temperature at x equal l comma y is equal to f of y, which is this one right here. The temperature at x comma zero, that's this one down here on the bottom wall, is equal to zero. And the temperature at x comma small l is also equal to zero. So as you can see, the governing equation is homogeneous. And there's only one non-homogeneous boundary condition. Therefore, separation of variables applies. We can use it directly. All right, so our governing equation is simply that the Laplace of T that comes straight out of here, if we take the k out, this will be k times the divergency of the gradient, which is the Laplace. So the Laplace of t of x and y is equal to zero, which can be expanded in Here's two, then two dimensions. This can be expanded in two dimensions as the partial derivative of t with respect to x squared, t is a function of x and y, plus the mm -hmm. second derivative of t with respect to y squared, function of x and y is equal to zero. By the way, the setup we're specifying is for a heat conduction problem, but it might as well apply to many types of problems that are governed by, by the same equation. So this, when we when we looked at, uh, when we're studying field theory, remember that we ended up relating the Laplace equations as a Laplace equation to many, many problems and mass transfer, diffusion of species, uh, momentum transfer, uh, there's uh, electromagnetics in certain cases, uh, it's governed by the Laplace equation, ideal fluid flows, uh, the, the stream function and the potential functions are governed by the same equation, Laplace equation. So it's not strictly just the heat equation, it's just that this we're using to illustrate how we actually go about solving this problem. So this is the equation that we're trying to solve. As you can see, it's a second order partial differential equation, right? Partial because they're partial derivative. Second order because the highest derivative is second order, right? It's an x and y. There's no time involved, so it's a steady state equation. Um, this equation is linear, as you can see. We have partial derivatives of any order, not multiplying each other, not elevated to any power, and so on. All right, so what do we do? So here comes the first assumption. We're going to let t of x and y be equal to some function x times some function y of y. So we're separating the variable. We're going to make the big assumption that whatever we find for t is such that it's going to be the multiplication of a function of x times the multiplication of a function of y. And let's see how that works. If, if we say that, then the derivative, the partial derivative of t with respect to x is essentially equal to the partial derivative with respect to x of this new assumption, which is x of x times y of y. And because y is not a function of x, I can take it out of that derivative operation as a constant. And just basically say that this will be this. And uh, because x is just a function of x, big x is just a function of x, it makes no sense to say partial derivative. So taking the partial derivative of a function of a single variable is the same thing as taking the total derivative. So this will be y of y times the derivative of x with respect to x, which we can just shortcut as y of y times x prime of x. That's it, just a short name for that. Likewise, we can do the same for the y derivative of t, which is d dy x of x, y of y. Then we can take the x of x out, and this will be the partial of y with respect to y. Now, because capital Y is a function of a single variable y, then this will be strictly the same as saying the total derivative of y with respect to y. Makes no sense to say partial derivative of something that's a function of a single variable. And because this is 
a single variable, I can say that this is x of x times y prime of y. That's it. Now, similarly, I can extend this to higher derivatives. So I can take the second derivative of t with respect to x squared. And if you follow the same logic here, you will end up being, this will end up being x double prime of x, y of y. And the second derivative of t with respect to y squared will be x of x times y double prime of y. Now, the same way you can do cross derivatives. If you have, for example, the second derivative of t with respect to x and y, this will be x prime, y prime. But the Laplace equation doesn't contain cross derivatives, but there are other uh, equations of conservation that include cross derivatives. So, therefore, if we have this equation, which is what we're trying to solve for, remember we're trying to find a solution of this equation that satisfies this equation and satisfy governing the boundary conditions as well. So this is the governing equation. We can replace this one with this one and this one with this one. So this means that this is x double prime of x times y of y plus x of x y double prime of y is equal to zero. So we can divide the whole thing by x and y, capital X and capital Y that is, and this will be identical to saying x double prime of x divided by x of x plus y double prime of y divided by y of y is equal to zero. So notice that what we've done is just divide the left and the right by, by t, by x times y. So that cancels this one, and that cancels this one, and that's what we end up with. So then I can take, for example, this term here, send it to the right-hand side, and I end up with this, minus y double prime of y, y of y. And as you can see, this is your new governing equation, new separated governing equation. This is equivalent to this governing equation based on the assumption that act that t was x times y. It's just that now it's separated because we have all functions of x on the left hand side and all functions of y on the right hand side. We assume that x was a function of x and therefore its second derivative can only be a function of x and the same thing for y. y is a function of y and therefore its second derivative can only be a function of y. So now it's separated. So what do we do with this information? So if this is the case, we can notice that the left-hand side is only a function <coughs> of x, and the right-hand side is only a function of y. That's what we know. We know that for sure. So based on that, the only possible way that the left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side, according to this equation, the only way to maintain that equality there <coughs> is that both sides are equal to a constant. Okay, there's no way that a function of x will be equal to a function of y, so <coughs> the only explanation for this equality here, which needs to be there because that's what the differential equation tells us, that was part of the governing equation, the only way that this can be maintained is that somehow x is such that its second derivative cancels out the x dependency and y is such that its second derivative cancels its y dependency and basically reverts to a constant that constant is equal on both sides of course because there's an equality so <clears throat> essentially and this is the key argument to this x double prime of x divided by x of x 
is equal to minus y double prime of y divided by y of y, which has to be equal to a constant, and we're going to call this constant lambda squared, and we're going to assign a sign to it, plus or minus. We don't know which one we're going to assign to it, so the reason why we make it square is to force it to be positive, and then we're going to assign a sign, plus or minus, to it, see which one works. So, <clears throat> the way to assign the sign is also key, and, and it's also extremely important, because if you assign the wrong side, you end up with no solution. It's that the sign of lambda square will be chosen based on the direction on which we want to form an eigenvalue problem. Let me explain what that is in detail. We from last class, we know what an eigenvalue is. We know what it looks like. So remember, we have this problem in x and y. Um, this problem goes from 0 to big L in the x direction and from 0 to small l in the y direction. The problem that we're trying to solve is the Laplace of t of x and y is equal to zero. Here's something I found on reference.com. And remember that the conditions are t equals zero here, t equals zero. This condition you is t equals zero. You want me to the conditions are t. And this condition is t equals to some function of y. You want me to know? All right. So, as you can see, the y direction looks like the homogeneous direction. So y happens to be homogeneous, because both conditions in the y direction are homogeneous. And as you can see, the x direction is non-homogeneous. All right, therefore, we must form an eigenvalue problem in the y direction. So we have to choose the sign of this separation constant in such a way that the resulting problem in the y direction is an eigenvalue problem. And the resulting problem in the x direction is not an eigenvalue problem. So in that case, x double prime of x divided by x of x, which is equal to minus y double prime of y divided by y of y, should be equal to plus lambda squared. So we're going to pick the plus sign. And the reason we picked the plus sign, let's see if we can fit this here, is that the resulting problem in the x direction is going to be x to the prime of x minus lambda square x of x is equal to zero, while the resulting problem in y will be, we have to flip the sign, so it's y double prime of x of y plus lambda square of y of y is equal to zero. By choosing the plus sign here on the separation constant, we form this problem in the x direction and this problem in the y direction. And as you know, from last class, this is not an eigenvalue problem, not an eigenvalue. This ODE is not an eigenvalue problem. You get solutions in terms of cosine hyperbolic and sine hyperbolic or exponential solutions, which do not oscillate. And this one is an eigenvalue problem. This one you'll get solutions in terms of sine and cosines, right? You need the solution in the y direction to be oscillative so that you can match two homogeneous conditions, zero and zero, without resorting to a trivial solution. Otherwise the solution will be zero in the y direction. And if the solution is zero in the y direction, 
then your solution will be zero. If y is zero, then t is zero. You cannot have a trivial solution. So the only way to have a non-trivial solution in the y direction, having two homogeneous conditions in the y direction, is by forming this special type of problem that would allow for to satisfy these two conditions, oscillating in between and giving you a non-zero solution in between. Well, in the x direction, you can afford to have a solution that's not an eigenvalue problem because you have a non-homogeneous condition. All right. So now we need to solve. These are the new two problems that you're going to be solving. From a single partial differential equation, we ended up with two ODEs, one for x and one for y. But we just created a new unknown, which is that lambda. We don't know what lambda is. Okay? It's just an arbitrary separation constant. So let's start. Let's solve the y problem first. And the y problem says y double prime of y plus lambda squared y of y is equal to zero. So that's a second order ODE. Um, and we know that the solution of this problem is y of y equals to a cosine of lambda y plus b sine of lambda y. That is the solution. That's the general solution to this ODE. All right. So what do we do with that? This is a general solution, y of y. So to arrive at a particular solution, we need boundary conditions. All right, so what do we do with the boundary conditions? Let's look at the original problem here, and we are told that in the y direction, we have temperature equal to zero on the bottom and temperature equal to zero on the top. So we, are, we know that the temperature at x comma zero, at y equals zero, is equal to zero, and we know that the temperature at x comma l is equal to zero on the top wall. This means that because t we separate into x of x and y of y, but y is equal to zero, should be equal to zero. And x of x times y of small l should be equal to zero. So we have the product of these two things is equal to zero, and the product of these two things has to be equal to zero. So when you have the product of two terms equaling zero, either one or the other has to be zero. So Either x of x is equal to zero, or y of zero is equal to zero. But, well, x of x cannot be equal to zero, because if we make x of x equal to zero, then the entire solution will be trivial. If x of x is equal to zero, then the entire solution is trivial. t is zero. So the only choice here is that y of zero is equal to zero. We're not saying that y of y is equal to zero. We're saying that y of zero only at y equals zero is equal to zero. Same thing here. Either x of x is equal to zero or y of l is equal to zero. Well, we cannot say that x of x is equal to zero, so our only choice is that y at l is equal to zero. So these are the boundary conditions that will allow us to get rid of these constants of integration, hopefully. All right, so see, this is an eigenvalue problem. The equation is homogeneous and the two boundary conditions are homogeneous, and we are going to try to find a non-trivial solution to this problem. So the logic behind this is that we cannot select x of x equals zero because this leads to a trivial solution. That is t of x and y, which is equal to x of x times y of y. And if we had chosen this one to be zero, then the whole thing will be zero. We cannot afford to do that. Right? So that's why we selected the other term in the product to be zero. All right. So let's impose these conditions. 
The first condition says that y at 0 is equal to 0, where y is this expression. So this will be a times the cosine of 0 plus b times the sine of 0. Remember that the cosine of 0 is equal to 1 and the sine of 0 is equal to 0. So 1 times a, 0 times b is equal to 0. This will result in a is equal to 0. So the only way for this product to be 0 is that a is equal to 0. All right, so we got that one. So what we end up with is b times the sine of lambda y. That's what we have left so far. This is half of a particular solution. We still have to apply the other condition. The other condition says that y at l is equal to 0. And then we have b times the sine of lambda l is equal to 0. And again, we're faced with the same situation. We have the product of b times the sine of lambda l equal to 0. If we choose b equal to 0, then it is going to destroy the entire solution. If b is equal to 0, y is equal to 0. And if y is equal to 0, the whole solution is equal to 0. So the only thing we can do is say that sine of lambda l must be equal to 0 for these to work out. And if the sine of lambda l is equal to 0, then we know that lambda l should be equal to n pi. Right? So multiples of pi of this angle will make the sine of that angle equal to 0. And therefore, lambda, which we are going to subscript with n, is equal to n pi over l. And this, as we know, are the eigenvalues. And therefore, y of y is equal to b times the sine of lambda n y are the eigenfunctions. Well, technically the eigenfunction is just simply the sine of lambda n l of lambda n y, so this is the eigenfunction. This is the eigenvalue, that's the eigenfunction. All right, so that's what we have so far. By doing, by applying the second boundary condition, we were not able to eliminate the second constant of integration, but we were able to determine what are the allowable values of the separation constant lambda that we just made up. Remember, that was an arbitrary constant that we introduced to separate the, the two solution sides. All right. So here's where we are. Now let's solve for the other side of the equation, the x of x. We already solved for y, or partially solved for y. We know now it's in terms of an eigenfunction that depends on some eigenvalues. This equation looks like x double prime of x minus lambda square x of x, which we know what lambda is now is a set of infinite values n pi over l is equal to zero. And we know that the general solution to this problem is c times the cosine hyperbolic of lambda x plus d times the sine hyperbolic of lambda x. And this is a general solution for x. General solution x of x. All right. Now we need boundary conditions as well. We need BCs. The BCs that we have in the x direction, let's go back to the original problem schematic. In the x direction, we have at x equals 0, the temperature is equal to 0, and at x equal big L, right here, t is equal to this function of y. So we have t, t at x equals 0, comma y is equal to 0. Well, t at x equal l comma y is equal to some function of y, some arbitrary function of y, the temperature profile on the right-hand side wall. All right, so by using the same separation, x of 0, y of y, and there's a product in between, should be equal to 0, and there is no other possible solution that x of 0 is equal to 0. So that is the 
boundary condition on the left hand side. So if x is 0 times y of y is equal to 0, either this one is 0 or this one is 0, but we cannot say that y of y is equal to 0. Again, same argument, because that will render the entire solution trivial. This one says that x of l times y of y should be equal to f of y. And what can we do about this? Can we say that x of l is equal to f of y? We cannot say that. This product is not equal to zero, so therefore we cannot say anything about any of the two. We could potentially say that y of y is proportional to f of y, but that's about it. So these particular boundary condition cannot be separated. If the boundary condition is non homogeneous, like this one in this case, it cannot be separated. So we are going to hold non homogeneous. BC for later. We're not going to use it yet, still, or yet, because we can't. We can't separate it. So the only thing that we know is that x of 0, this is the only condition we know, the only one that we could separate in this direction, x of 0 is equal to 0, which means that um, c times the cosine hyperbolic of 0 plus d times the sine hyperbolic of 0 should be equal to 0. And the cosine hyperbolic of 0 is 1, while well, the sine hyperbolic of 0 is 0. And that basically means that c is equal to 0. All right. So x of x is d times the sine hyperbolic of lambda x. And as you can see, this is not an eigenvalue function, not an eigenfunction. It is not an eigenfunction. It's a sine hyperbolic, which is just an exponential function. It doesn't oscillate. So merging the two solutions, we end up with the temperature of x and y, which is x of x times y of y should be equal to, well, x of x is d times the sine hyperbolic of lambda x. We know that lambda is lambda n, it's an eigenvalue, it's a set of, po of all possible eigenvalues, n pi over l. y of y is b times the sine of lambda n f, n y. So when we multiply b times d, we end up with another constant, which we can call e. We don't have to include the two constants. So we have b times d is just another constant, e. Sine hyperbolic of lambda nx. We're going to use the index n to denote that there's multiple ones of these. And sine of lambda ny. OK, so this is an infinite infinite possible solutions to the governing equation and three of the BCs for each value of lambda n equals to n pi over small l for n going from zero all the way to infinity, right? So you have solutions in all possible frequencies separated by these discrete separation, n pi over l. All right, so what do we do with an infinite number of solutions if we only need one? This is a well-posed problem, it's linear. We have a complete set of boundary conditions in a governing equation, we should have a single unique solution to this problem. So what we're going to do, and in order to do that, we're going to have to determine this constant of integration E, whatever it is. And not only that, try to hone in into which one of these eigenvalues is the right one. If there's a right one, which one do we use? Do we use 3 pi over L? Do we use 5 pi over L? Which one is the one that produces the right solution? Remember that we've only imposed three of the boundary conditions. We are yet to impose the last one. And that's where the key of going down from a, an infinite 
set of possible solutions to a single one. I'm just gonna, this is how it's gonna work. Now, the first thing is so using the principle of superposition. Remember, we looked at this when we were studying ordinary differential equations of the linear kind. That says if you have a solution y1, which is the solution to this ODE, and then you have a solution y2, which is also a solution to the same ODE, you can produce a solution y3, which is a linear combination of y1 and y2, and would also satisfy the governing equation. That's a basic principle of superposition. You can construct as, as many solutions as you want by linearly combining existing solutions. So this says two solutions of the same linear ODE can be linearly combined to produce a third solution. And we can do this an infinite number of times because remember we have an infinite number of possible solutions given by these eigenvalues, right? And get values from zero to infinity. So basically we can say the solution could be a linear combination, an infinite linear combination from n equal one to infinity of some combination constants E n sine hyperbolic of lambda nx sine of lambda ny. So we can basically um, linearly combine all possible solutions, right, of all possible eigenvalues into a single solution by linearly combining with these constants E sub n. So now we've reduced that number from infinity to always, also infinity. We haven't reduced the possible solutions because we have an infinite number of um, Linear, linear combination constants E sub n that we need to determine. So, this is a general solution, still a general solution, with an infinite number of constants of integration so these are technically constants of integration that resulted out of the integration of this equation, e sub 1, e sub 2, e sub 3, e sub infinity, to be determined. Okay, now one parenthesis here is that remember that the eigenvalues that we had determined, n pi over l, were valid from n equals 0 to infinity. So the eigenvalues were, the possible eigenvalue were 0, pi over L, 2 pi over L, 3 pi over L, and so on and so forth. Why did we start the summation at 1 and not at 0? We can say 0, and that's perfectly fine. It's just that it makes no difference because at n equals 0, the eigenvalue n pi over L is equal to 0, and the sine of 0 goes to 0. So the first term on the summation, if you start at 0, goes to 0 anyway. So there's no point. So rather than trying to choose a, a single eigenvalue for which the solution works, we can just say it works for all eigenvalues. And we're going to do is combine them all. And we're going to combine them all with these infinite constants of combination, we call constants of integration. And now we, uh, we have to determine what these are. So where are they? Well, hopefully this last, the only boundary condition that we are yet to use is, well, t of l comma y is equal to f of y. So we haven't used that because we couldn't separate it into x or y. So basically, the temperature on the right-hand side wall is still a first-kind boundary condition, Dirichlet, is equal to some function, arbitrary function f, which we can just put a hat on it to the node that is given. So basically, if we plug this in here, we say f of y should be equal to the summation from n equal 1 to infinity of 
e sub n, the sine hyperbolic of lambda n l, times the sine of lambda n y. And somehow, well, this is an infinite series, it's an infinite summation, so some function of y on the left, some function of y on the right, and somehow, and this is known, so this is a known function, so somehow from this expression, we have to solve for an infinite number of e sub n. And the trick here is orthogonality. This is how we're going to isolate this, this constant e to be able to find it. So what we're going to do is multiply both sides of this expression by the eigenfunction. And the eigenfunction is the sine of lambda n y, and we're going to change the subscript. We're going to call it lambda n y. You're going to see why. So this is an expression on equality. So we can say this is sine of lambda m y is equal to the summation from n equal one to infinity of e sub n sine hyperbolic of lambda n l sine of lambda n y, sine of lambda m y. Okay. All right. So we just complicated things. Um, but what we basically did was multiply both sides by the same eigenfunction, but at a different frequency, right? Different eigenvalue denoted by another letter m, which is independent from the one in the summation. So here we have a multiplication of the eigenfunction times itself at different frequencies. And we know that if we integrate this, integrate over the y domain, so from 0 to L, so y goes from 0 to small l, and if we do that, we end up with the integral from 0 to L, of f y and I'm writing and putting that hat over f y to just to denote that it's a given function that we know it, whatever it is. dy is equal to and by the way when I when I integrate the right hand side, because this is not a function of y and this is not a function of y, I can take them out of the integral. So this will be the summation from n equal one to infinity. So the integral of the summation is the same thing as the summation of the integral e sub n sine hyperbolic of lambda n l times the integral from 0 to l of the sine of lambda n y times the sine of lambda m y dy. And you can see here that this is starting to look like something that we can handle because from the orthogonality property of eigenfunctions, in particular this eigenfunction sine of lambda nm, the integral, and we're gonna we call this the norm of lambda n, the integral from zero to L of the sine of lambda n y, sine of lambda m y dy is equal to either zero if n is different than m, n in this case l over two, the norm can be slightly different depending on what the eigenfunction is, if n is equal to m. So basically this integral on the right hand side, the integral on the right hand side will vanish for every value of n in the summation, summation, except when n is equal to m. So if we expand the summation from one to infinity into term e1 sine hyperbolic of lambda one l of this integral e2 of the integral e3, so we have an infinite number of times in that summation. All these integrals, all these infinite integrals except one will go to zero. That's the one when n is equal to m. 
So basically, what we end up is just with all these values on the left hand side, it remains the integral from zero to L, f of y sine lambda m y dy is equal to all the terms in the summation go away except when n is equal to m sine hyperbolic of lambda m l that's capital L and the integral from zero to L of these will basically be the integral from zero to L of sine square of lambda m y dy and according to this expression this one is L over 2. So in one brush we eliminated infinite minus 1 terms in the series and just ended up with 1. So basically we can solve for E sub m is equal to 2, so this is L over 2, so it will be 2 over L, 2 divided by L times the sine hyperbolic of lambda m L times the integral from 0 to L of this function f of y, whatever it is, is given, sine lambda m y dy. Okay, or then we, we may switch back to n, so we can change m to n, there's nothing that prevents us from saying that if this expression in terms of m is this, then in terms of n is simply sine hyperbolic of lambda n l times the integral from 0 to l f of y sine of lambda n y dy. And that is all infinite of those constants of integration. Okay, so notice that we did not eliminate infinite minus one constants of integration. They all exist. And here's the answer. There's an infinite number of them that are going to be part of this solution. But we have in one stroke, in this particular expression, eliminated all these integrals so that we end up with a single expression for e. And there it is. We have infinite we, in the, with a single imposition of a boundary condition, which is this one. We found infinite number of constants of integration. And that was pretty powerful. That's because of the combination of superposition and orthogonality. All right. So remember too that uh, this e is part of these solution now, which is now a particular solution, e sub n, sine hyperbolic of lambda n x, sine of lambda n y. Such that lambda n is equal to n pi over small l. And as we can see, this is the particular solution. So this last three frames is the particular solution. Particular solution. And that's it. All right, so if you wanted something specific, well, let's say that this function f of y, so for instance, for example, what if, if f of y is equal to one? So let's go back to the original problem here. So we're saying, what if f of y is equal to 1? We look at the original problem. What we basically have is the same equation, and the set of boundary conditions is 0, 0, 0. And on the right-hand side, the temperature is equal to 1. So we have a ramp uh, step, I'm sorry. Uh, function there on the right hand side equal to 1. So if f of y is equal to 1 then the constant of integration e sub n is equal to 2 L sine hyperbolic of lambda n L times the integral from 0 to L of 1 that's f of y times the sine of lambda n y dy. 
So e sub n is equal to 2 L sine hyperbolic of lambda and L. The integral of the sine is minus the cosine, so there will be minus the cosine of lambda n y divided by lambda n evaluated between 0 and L. Okay, and remember, lambda n is equal to n pi over L, and therefore the cosine of when y is equal to L, it will be the cosine of lambda L, the cosine of n pi is equal to, well, the co sorry. So this expression needs to be evaluated at y equal L and at y equals zero. So at y equals zero, we have the cosine of zero is equal to one. And, but the cosine of lambda n L will be just the cosine of n pi. It's the cosine of 180 degrees and the cosine of 360 and 540. And so every half turn. So it's either minus one or one, depending on whether n is even or odd. So it's minus one to the power of n. If n is odd, and then it will be minus one. If n is even, there will be a full turn, and then this will be one. And the cosine of zero is equal to one. So here we can just place this into this expression. And the resulting constant of integration e sub n for the particular case in which the right-hand side wall is kept at one, uh, a temperature at 1 is 2 times 1 minus minus 1 to the power of n. This is this expression divided by lambda n, which is n pi over L, multiplying L. The L goes away, so this will be n pi times the sine hyperbolic of n pi over L times, by the way, this is capital L. This is capital L. Capital L. And the solution remains this. The same solution, it's just the constant of integration now take on the form this. And then this is supposed to perfectly fit. First of all, satisfy the governing equation, which is the Laplace equation in this case, and fit all these four boundary conditions, zero on the bottom, zero on the top, zero on the left, and one on the right, just by implementing this expression. How is that even possible if we're fitting an infinite number of frequency signs into this equation? To fit a solution that on the right hand side at x equal capital L is one, is a constant. Well, it does so by combining multiple frequencies of signs together to make up this step function that is equal to one on the right hand side. Okay. It will have a, a little bit of a problem. The series is called Fourier series. Right? It will have a slightly difficult problem fitting the condition at the corners. Because as you can see here, the temperature needs to be zero on the bottom, on the left, and on the top, but it needs to be one on the right hand side. And therefore, what is the solution at the corner? Is it one or zero? Solution has to be single value, right? We cannot acquire a double value at a single point. So it is a combination of zero and one at the same time. So the solution, whatever the series are trying to do, fitting all these signs of different frequencies to give you the exact value of one on the right-hand side, is going to have a, some trouble catching that uh, perfect value at the corner. But it does so very well if you include enough terms in the series. Okay. So this is the particular case for which the right-hand side function f of y is just a constant, it's one. Again, this leads to a non-trivial solution. It has to because we have a non-homogeneous condition on the right-hand side. The whole problem is homogeneous except that condition t is equal to one on the right-hand side. So how can a solution t that satisfies the governing equation Laplace of t and it satisfy these boundary conditions simultaneously be something that looks like a step it's a combination of sine hyperbolics and sines of infinite number of frequencies, all separated by these constants of linear combinations that look like this. Well, let's put that to practice and see how it looks like in a, in a MathCAD spreadsheet. And obviously in MathCAD, we're not going to be able to evaluate an infinite terms in a series. So we're going to have to truncate that series at some point. So let's assume that uh, 
L is equal to 1 and small l is equal to 1. So we have a square domain. It just makes no difference in this case. And let's say that we are going to include, I don't know, 30 terms in the series. If we include 30 terms in the series, assuming that we're saying we're truncating the series after 30 terms, it's not going to truncate very fast because look at the constant of integration E sub n is divided by n. It's not divided by n squared or n factorial. Like in the case of a, of a Taylor series, it decays that this uh, this constants uh, or these uh, 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 constants of integration or these uh, uh, parameters in the series decay very fast because the denominator usually contains factorial values of n. In this case, it's just n, so it will decay very slowly. So basically, we are what we're saying is that this temperature of x and y is a linear combination of 30 possible solutions of 30 possible frequencies, the sine of n pi over l. 1 pi over L, 2 pi over L, 3 pi over L, all the way to 30 pi over L. So we're truncating after the 30th term, right? And this is the constant of integration for the case when the function y is equal to 1. On the right-hand side, function f is equal to 1. So notice that when we do that, the series has, a problem, has some trouble truncating. When we evaluate the temperature at x equal L, and y equal y, essentially on the right hand side, and plot it against the value of y from 0 to 1. Uh, maybe not include that many. Well, yeah, maybe the resolution was okay. Notice that we're not getting exactly the step function 1 on the right hand side. We're getting some sort of oscillation around 1. And the more terms we include in the series, if we go from 30 to 40, then it just packs a little closer and closer. Those frequency, those 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 uh, subharmonics start canceling each other, right? And it's, it, it it would actually try to uh, converge on the corner in particular, where is where it has most of the trouble. On the corners, remember, right at the corner here, there's a 2D plot. At the corner, the temperature has to be zero, and it has to be one simultaneously, and that's why it has some trouble actually collapsing to a solution. But if we go from uh, from 50 to 100 terms in the series. Notice that they're packed closer and closer. Now it looks almost like a flat line. If we go to 150, it's almost there. And we can keep going. 200, it's almost perfectly flat, but there's still the error at the corner. It looks almost perfectly flat, except for that error at the corner at temperature equal one. And we can go all the way to 220. I think past that point, MathCat has trouble actually evaluating the series. Now, see, what I'm doing to plot this in 2D is just basically taking and building up an array that is a function of i and j, right? Uh, I'm building up an array uh, with, with indices i and j from 0 to 100, so building up a, a matrix of 101 terms by 101 terms that are determ determined by evaluating this expression, t of x and y, all 220 values in the series uh, at every one of the values of x and y is denoted or equally spaced by these steps from zero to 100, right? And that's what we get here for the solution. Um, and at x equal zero, we get zero. At y equal zero, we get zero. At y equal small l, we get zero. And at x equal big L, um, we get one. And this is a contour plot. This is the, uh, let me try to zoom into this. This is the surface plot and the contour plot of the same thing, right? Again, if I go to less number of eigenvalues, let's say go back to 50, it will look very choppy there at x equal 1, right? And also the convergency will be complicated. Now, let's assume that the um, boundary condition that was given on the right-hand side wasn't 1, because, you know, the one there's a physical issue with this problem, is that the fact that it has a double value at a corner, and a double value is very difficult to catch, very difficult to model by this Fourier series. So, um, let's, let's try to, let's try a more physical problem in which the boundary condition on the right hand side is a parabola. A parabola that goes to zero at y equals zero, and it goes to zero at y equals small l, and it goes to one at y equals one half of l. Right? So when y is equal zero, this expression goes to zero. When y is equal l, this expression goes to zero. And when y goes to one half of l, this is one half times one half of L. That's one quarter of L squared divided by L squared is one quarter times times four. 
then f of y will be, I can just evaluate it here, f of 0 f of 0 is equal to 0. f of small l is equal to 0. But if I evaluate this f at half of l, I get 1. So that's what that expression says. So now the constants of integration e sub n is no longer, whoops, it's no longer this expression. It's no longer this expression because this was the resulting expression out of, out of saying f of y was equal to 1. Now f of y is equal to this parabola. So I need to explicitly solve that integral, which I can do by hand, by uh, uh, integration by parts twice and so on. But I don't want to deal with that. So I'm going to let MathCat do the integral for me. It's just going to take some time for MathCat to do it. And the whole expression for e sub n is equal to this. Same one we wrote in the notes. And now the series solution, t of x and y, is the combination of, let's say, the first 20 uh, eigenvalues, which then uh, didn't actually uh, converge very nicely for the case of a constant step function. Um, in this case, it's just e sub n is this expression. So this is different constants of integration. And when we evaluate that function at x equal l, notice that we get perfectly a parabola. It has no trouble, only with 20 eigenvalues, 20 terms in the series. It has no trouble at all capturing the parabola and capturing the value of the corner because there's no longer double values at the corner. The temperature is equal to zero at the upper corner and at the lower corner. And there's a perfect match from the boundary condition on top and on the bottom. So we don't have that double value. And the solution is really, really smooth, as you can see. And now I have this expression that shows like there's a parabola profile on the right hand side. It satisfies again that the temperature is equal to here on the bottom, on the left, and on the right. So this is what I wanted to show you today. Again, this is a basic application of the method of separation of variables, and this is just an implementation of it, so that you can see how it, how well it actually uh, implements and and how well it actually captures the solution. It obviously depends on how well posed the physics of the problem are, when you have a jump or singularity, or when you have a physically plausible set of boundary conditions like this one. So thank you for your attention and I will see you next class.